Good morning and welcome to the 12th meeting of the Public Audit and Post-Legislative Scrutiny Committee in 2018. Can I ask everyone in the public gallery to please switch off their electronic devices or switch them to silence so they don't affect the committee's work? Item number one, decision on taking business in private. Do we agree to take items three and four in private? Agreed. Thank you. Item two is the 2016-17 audit of NHS Tayside. I'd like to welcome our witnesses today, Paul Gray, Director General Health and Social Care, Scottish Government and Chief Executive NHS Scotland, and Christine McLaughlin, Director of Health Finance, Scottish Government. I would like to um, ask Paul Gray the opening question, if I may. Uh, Mr Gray, we have received a letter from you setting out um, a series of all the investigations that are um, ongoing into NHS Tayside and also a list of um, timescales as, as we have it. Um, it seems to me that there, I think there's about half a dozen of, of these investigations. Some of them are statutory and clearly you couldn't hand them uh, over to anyone else. But I'm wondering if you were at all tempted to kind of um, pull this into one big investigation. That's for clarity. That's my first question. Um, and the second question is, um, if you could perhaps uh, take us through these investigations, your understanding of what they will cover, um, when they will report, and also your, your anticipated timescales for them. Okay, thank you, uh, Convener. And I'm, I'll bring Christine in on some of the detail, if, I'm, if I may. Um, for your first question was, would, would it would it be better or simpler to bring them all into one? And, and, and we have thought about this, but as you say, there are a number of statutory aspects to this with which we uh, can't and uh, shouldn't interfere. What I do propose to do once I've received the main uh, reports that I'm expecting in the course of the next few weeks is to, is to review the whole. And uh, I think I will say quite frankly to the committee that while I expect what we receive to be sufficient in its coverage, if there is something that I feel is missing from what has been done, I will ask for that to be followed up. So we'll, we will uh, go on the basis that at the moment what has been commissioned is sufficient, but if it appears not to be, or if the committee were at any point to raise questions that we thought would not be adequately covered in what we have done, I'm, I'm not... Uh, resistant to the idea that we might need to extend the scope a little. I think, however, to stop at this point and decommission what's already going on would, would, be, would do much more harm than good. So that's my, that's my broad answer to your first question. Um, now, I'm anxious not to repeat uh, unnecessarily what's in, my, what's in my letter and correspondence. So, I'll step very quickly through the main yes, components, please. but I'm happy to take further questions as, as we go. So the external review by Grant Thornton is the first one I will mention about NHS Tayside's financial governance reserves and use of deferred expenditure, and also the Board's response to the initial independent review into the allocation of e-health funding, and that's due on the 15th of May, so that's next week. Um, that will be shared with the committee and decisions about any further action will be informed by the findings of the review. So that, that is a pretty broad-based review by Grant Thornton into what Tayside themselves have done and are doing. Um, there's a formal, uh, then a formal inquiry under Section 28 of the Charity, Charities and Trustee Investment Scotland Act by Oscar, and that timing is for them. And I understand from Christine that they have written to the committee further about that. Um, now, in one sense, any follow-up action will be a matter for Oscar, but in the other sense, that it is that if Oscar are to make recommendations to us that go beyond Tayside, um, we'll want to take these pretty seriously. Um, one of the things we're already considering is um, a better separation between the um, oversight of endowment funds and the responsibilities of non-executives on the board. So I, I'm quite happy to place on record that that's um, firmly in our, in our view. Um, 
Professor Sir Lewis Ritchie will continue as the chair of the Assurance Advisory Group and report to me on the 15th of October. Now, I'm not waiting for that to do um, other things that will come out of uh, Grant Thornton and uh, Oscar. Um, I also have the uh, returns from the chairs of the NHS boards on their use of endowment funds, so that's all boards. Um, Oscar will respond to me initially on that by the end of May, but I, I don't expect that to be their final uh, response. Um, and I'm happy to give the, the committee more detail on these responses, should they wish it. Um, I, probably in writing rather than try and go through them line by line today. But again, I'm happy to take it as the committee prefers. Um, <clears throat> NHS National Services Scotland uh, commissioned work by their internal auditors, KPMG, and that has reported I was due to meet uh, the chair and the chief executive of NSS last week to discuss that. But as the committee knows, I think my mother passed away and that meeting had to be cancelled. So I'll be meeting them shortly. And again, I'll be happy to report to the committee in more detail once I've had the opportunity to discuss that with them. Um, and the Scottish Government's Director of Internal Audit is due to report to us on the 4th of June on her uh, review of actions taken by Scottish Government eHealth and Health Finance, because I thought we needed to have uh, a separate um, look at that uh, and um, the adequacy of what we had done. So these are the main things that are in train at the moment, um, and I'm happy, as I say, to go into more detail uh, with Christine, should that be helpful? Have I missed anything, Christine? You, you, <clears throat> you've not missed anything, but it might it might be helpful also just to clarify, because as you say, there are um, six pieces of work underway. That we had the the e-health issues that Grant Thornton looked at, and the endowments issues are, to me, separate separate issues. That they're all related to position T side, but they're separate. Grant Thornton's review was Scottish Government e-health leads NSS and T side. And now, so what we're doing as a result of that is, is the follow-up on the actions that are required for all three parties. So although there are lots of pieces under work, three of them are about the follow-up for Tayside in more detail in financial governance, the follow-up in NSS on their controls and the follow-up in Scottish Government. So three of those pieces of work are really the follow-up from that report. Um, we then had the endowments issue and we took the opportunity to ask Grant Thornton to broaden the piece of work that they were doing on the initial e-health work to include a review of the board side of the endowments issues. So the, um, Grant Thornton can't, within this work, won't look at the, the role of the trustees and the appropriateness that's for Oscar to do. Um, but I think that felt to us that that gave us a really good belt and braces approach to the, the full aspects of the, um, the role of the non-executives as members of Tayside NHS board, mm. whilst Oscar look at the role as trustees of the endowment fund. Um, so I, I realise if you look at them individually that, that it looks like there's a lo lot of things and are they joined up. But actually, if you think that some of them are following from the first piece and then the endowments work, if that helps to clarify at all. So that allows, I think at the end of that, we can consolidate all of the, the actions and make sure we've got a comprehensive um, approach to how we tackle this going forward. OK, let me um, just pick up on one of these reports. It's the Oscar report. I'm just um, a little concerned. You may, I wrote to David Robb, I think, last week, asking for clarity on timescale on this, because, of course, we're hearing back from Grant Thornton next week on Tuesday, um, 15th of May. But David Robb in his letter said, at the current stage of the inquiry, it's not possible for us to set a particular timescale. And he goes on to say he would expect to be in a position by 31st of May to report to the committee on the inquiry's progress and its future direction. I think given um, the endowment fund issue um, was really the thing that precipitated the change at NHS Tayside and the huge public interest in this, are, I, I'm a little concerned about the sort of lack of clarity over time scale and how this is going to progress. Do you share that concern? Well. Clearly, I would like to see as much information as quickly as possible. It's important that, in terms of public confidence, we resolve these issues in a way which is transparent and speedy. 
However, Oscar is operating independently um, under its own legislation. But uh, I can assure you that we are keeping in close touch with Oscar. I know that Christine uh, spoke to the chief executive yesterday, um, and uh, they, they know very clearly that, that we are anxious to see material from them, including any recommendations, as quickly as they can feasibly do that. But we, uh, as with other um, public scrutiny bodies, Audit Scotland and so forth, we can't direct them. It's their matter to decide the, the, the pace at which they will do it. What I will say, however, and, and again, I think this is on the record already, we have offered to fund um, any backfill within Oscar if, if they need to release people to do this work. So we, we are clear that should the chief executive decide that additional resource would help, uh, I'm willing as accountable officer for the NHS to fund any costs that he faces. So we are doing everything we can to support Oscar, but, but clearly they must maintain their independence from us. That's good to hear because, as I say, I think in terms of public interest, the Oscar report will be one of the, the key reports that the committee receives. Um, can I ask Colin Beattie to continue questioning? Thank you, Vera. Um, I'd like to start just by clarifying the, cu the current status of the previous CEO. You, you mean Leslie McClay? Yes. Yes. Ms McClay is off sick at present. What are the financial implications for the NHS of that? Well, any person who's an employee of the, of the NHS in Scotland uh, will have, within their normal terms and conditions, the... Um, prospect of being paid for being on sick leave. She is signed off sick by a doctor um, and we, we must accept that. So she will be paid as anyone else would be. She will be paid her current salary while she remains on sick leave up to a point in time uh, at which time any person, again, uh, without reference to specific individuals, would go on to half pay and then they would go on to no pay over a, a, a defined period of time. What is her current status within the NHS? She remains an employee of NHS Tayside. But, but not CEO? That's correct. Okay. She's not the accountable officer. That, that is Malcolm Wright. Okay. Can you uh, just clarify for the public record, Mr Gray, what, that's, what the, the CEO salary is? I can get you it. I, I, won't, I, won't, I could give you an estimate, but I'll get you an accurate um, statement. It will be in last year's accounts, but I can get you it. Do that. Okay. Colin. Okay. I'd like to just turn to the uh, Grant Thornton audit terms of reference. Now, the internal audit in NHS Tayside is EY. In the case of NSS, the internal auditor is KPMG. You said in, in, in previous remarks there that KPMG were carrying out an internal review of NSS. Of NSS. Yeah. Why isn't EY doing similar for NHS Tayside? Um, just to clarify, Ernest Young are not the internal auditors in, in Tayside. They were brought in to do a particular piece of work for us. Um, a point of time in a diagnostic under financial position. Um, it's a consortium, an internal in-house NHS consortium called FTF that provide the internal audit services in NHS Tayside. Just That's a little bit different that. from my understanding. When you say an internal consortium, what does that mean? So it's a, it's a um, internal auditors are either um, external um, audit firms that are, are um, commissioned for boards or they can be in-house employees of the NHS. FTF is a consortium that is employed by NHS Fife and provide audit services through service level agreements to a number of boards um, in Scotland. So it's, a, <coughs> it's a, a, an in-house in team that provide that internal audit services. So it's an internal audit team? That's correct. That was not what I understood previously. Erinson Young were commissioned by us when um, uh, Sir Lewis Ritchie did the initial review of Tayside to give us a, um, a, an independent due diligence of the financial position in NHS Tayside, but they are not the internal auditors of NHS Tayside. 
This in internal audit function, which uh, operates, you say, out of NHS Fife. That's correct. Where, do they provide audit services elsewhere in the NHS? They provide audit services to uh, NHS Fife, to Tayside, to Forth Valley, um, and they provide um, a, a service um, on a, a combined basis for NHS Lanarkshire, where they provide oversight to the in-house team in Lanarkshire. So across the country, you'll have a mix of different audit providers. Every board commissions their audit um, individually um, in their internal audit. This particular in-house group, how are they structured? What, what is their composition? Are they a separate uh, company, or are they simply a, no, a division? No, they're the employees of, of, of NHS um, Fife. I, mean, I, I can get you more detail if you like. It, it's a, it's an in-house team, and, and it works on a, a service level agreement, but they follow the same um, code of conduct for any internal audit. It's not, it's not uncommon. Scottish Government has a, um, an in-house internal audit service. So this internal audit group, would you say that they work on an arm's length basis, the same as, for example, EY or KPMG, in terms of providing the internal audit function? They, when you say an arm's length basis, they provide a, a, a service to agreed um, terms for, for the board. We could, I can get you any details like that that you would like to, to see. I don't have it to hand. But it's been a, um, an arrangement, it's been a long standing arrangement within the NHS for so, a number of boards. So the board negotiates with. That's good. That organisation to receive a specified audit. Yep, to the same standards as all of the NHS. The same internal audit accounting standards would apply to any any public body, and they apply to Tayside as the they do everywhere else. Are the terms of the internal audit uh, uniform across the NHS? Well, the, the the standards to which the internal auditors operate are, are uniform. Um, the Boards would, would have a procurement process. So if you were if you were using a, a firm such as KPMG or Ernst Young, you would tender for services for a period of time. Um, so an in-house team is an equivalent to, to using an external firm. Do they go, do they uh, take part in tender? I, I can I can follow up with details of what the arrangements are within um, within Tayside, but it's a, see, it's an arrangement that covers more than than Tayside. It covers three or four boards. Was there a particular reason? I'm looking at different layers here. I mean, we've, we, we seem to have been throwing a lot of money at auditors. You've got your internal team. You've had EYN. Now we've got Grant Thornton. And I'm looking at the terms of reference here for what this review they're going to do is. And it all seems a bit airy-fairy to me. An assessment and opinion on the design of the new control measures. Really? We'll see. We will ensure that processes are in place, clear descriptions and purpose of allocations. You know, all this should be in place already, and you have people coming in again and again, looking at processes. What, what I would like to see is who did what, when, where does the responsibility lie, where's the investigation that's uh, that's going to bring that out. I assume that processes are right. But processes don't all, even if you follow the process and tick the box, it doesn't mean to say you're going to come up with the right answer. So where is the review that's going to give dates, times, what happened, who did what, who was responsible? Sorry? So you're asking in terms of the endowment in particular or more generally? More generally. I mean, something went wrong. And the assumption seems to be that the process may have failed and that if they have the right processes in place, you'll get the right answer. That's not always the case. In this particular case, something went wrong. Maybe deliberately, maybe not. There was certainly misreporting. How did it happen? Dates, times, who did what, when? Who was responsible? So in relation to the... Um Endowment, first of all, uh, in, in Tayside, um, Oscar will give a report on that. They will, and it will be for them to uh, decide what goes into that report. Um, wh what I can say is there is a substantial body of documentation which has been shared with Oscar, including minutes of meetings and uh, background paperwork. Um, I've seen some of that, um, and I 
I'm perfectly clear that it tells you exactly on what dates things were done and who was present and so on and so forth. So I, I don't think there's uh, likely to be a difficulty in establishing the facts of the matter. Indeed, I think they're probably fairly clearly established. But what about the misreporting? I mean, NSS, I mean, this is not covered, this, this review will not cover that. No, it won't, but that's why I'm uh, intending to meet the uh, Chair and the Chief Executive of NSS, as I've said, to review what they've produced by way of an internal review by KPMG, and I will discuss that with them. I haven't, I, I haven't read it, Mr Beatty, so I can't answer your question because I, I came back to work this morning. I mean, I accept that uh, Oscar obviously have their own area to look at and, yeah. you know, they will come up with the answers they need on that. But there's far more fundamental failures here within the system. And I don't see the investigation taking place that's going to bring out exactly what went wrong and why and who. What we've got is we're looking at, de looking at, uh, s at designs of, of controls. We're looking at processes. <clears throat> That's not, go that's not going to bring out the information that's needed. There has already been a, a, a work done on the, on the um, NSS and e-health and Tayside transfer of funds. Now, that, that's separate from the endowments, as, as Christine has explained. Mm. But I think we do know fairly clearly what happened and what sequence in that setting. Where's the document that lays all that out? We can provide that. I think it's something that uh, would be interesting to see. I, um, so the Grant Thornton report, um, I think, did, did, did that? I don't know if you felt that that's sufficient, but the Grant Thornton report did set out the, um, the sequence of events. The KPMG internal audit in NSS does that in more, in more detail in relation to the involvement in NSS. Um, I think it's important that internal auditors do folk they have a role to play in um, what we normally tell the, the, the lines of defence within an organisation. So um, it, it is right and proper that internal audit look at the control environment and the way in which you um, can assess the actions of individuals and system management in the system and then provide that independent assurance. So I, I actually take quite a lot of comfort from the extent to which the, the, the remit does what we need it to do. It's not, it's not a review into individuals performance, it's, an in, it's a review into the control environment within the organisation. Um, that, that's what we've set out to, to do with the work. So I, I, I think we need to be clear that it's not, okay. it's not looking at people and, okay. and what they did. Okay. Can I follow up? Excuse me a minute, Colin. Colin raised the point about internal audit and you've clarified that it is an internal consortium. Um, that came to light in Helen McArdle's original report in the Herald newspaper regarding this endowment fund. Um, issue, but can I read something to you? Um, the journalist source said, um, it's easy to threaten internal auditors with the suggestion that they will lose the contract if they rock the boat. They are treading fi the fine line between it being employees and independent arbiters. Now, this source had said that internal auditors from NHS Fife and Forth Valley had questioned how endowment fund cash was being used, but they were warned that they risked losing their contract with NHS Tayside unless they backed off. Now, this is unsubstantiated. This was reported in the newspaper. But can I ask you to follow on from what Colin was saying? Is it a concern to you that this has been said that an internal consortium, as you say, I assume they're in use all across Scotland in the NHS, um, can so easily, according to the source, be threatened with losing their contract by speaking out. Is this something you're concerned about? Anyone who threatens anyone in the NHS is breaching the values of the NHS and the terms and conditions of their employment. So if that has been done, it is utterly wrong and completely unacceptable. So I wish to place that on the record. If the work that we're doing with Oscar shows that um, inappropriate pressure was put on internal audit, then that is something that will be dealt with. It is not acceptable. The only way that these things can function is if, the, is if people are able to do their professional duties without fear 
of censure or losing their jobs. So I'm very clear about that. And if that's something that doesn't come out, Mr Gray, in the report, so I think you gave the commitment at the start of the committee meeting that you, you would commit to looking at the issues that, that perhaps don't come out of the reports. If there are issues that are not covered that remain of concern to us or to the committee, we will pursue them. OK. Bill Bowman has a short point on this issue specifically, and then I'm going to bring in Willie Coffey. Thank you, Convener. Can I just mention, um, refer to my register of interest, KPMG is mentioned in the in the papers here. I used to be a partner in KPMG, but of course I've had nothing to do with any of this work. Um, coming back to Colin Beattie's point, on the scope of the review of Grant Thornton, I took some comfort from the section under financial governance, which says the work will include the circumstances related to the retrospective use of endowments and the circumstances in relation to the use of the deferred expenditure. Now, that to me did not just mean the process of who did what when, but why somebody did something. And I just want to be clear that if that's not in the report, you will look to what I would call the root cause. Somebody did something for a reason. Now, the timeline is just the timeline. The protective measures you may put in place are the protective measures, but until you get back to why that happened, what caused that, I don't think we have the full um, situation. Can you undertake that if that's not in the report, you would look to see that? We want to understand the root causes, Mr Bowman, because we don't want this to happen again. It's about as simple as that. OK, so I'll put that point down yeah, and we'll yeah. see what, what is there. Can I also clarify that, that um, so I've been in contact with Grant Thornton about the work that they're doing, and I am clear that they are looking at internal audit reports, um, what risks were flagged, how they were followed through, differences between drafts and final report. So I, I, I do expect that the um, the allegations that were made will be um, the, the, the fact that, that we will be looking at internal audit um, so reports. Internal auditors being spoken to by Grant Thornton. Yes. So yeah. they will be interviewed. They'll yes. get put their point of yeah. view. Okay, yeah. great. Um, Willie Coffey. Thanks very much, convener, and good morning to, to you both. I mean, the, the, the issues that have come up on the NHS T side have, have come up well, as we understand that there have been robust systems of internal audit, scrutiny, risk management and so on already in place. And the reports and investigations that have been carried out just now, and we don't know what, what they're going to say, but I can guess they'll probably point at systems and processes and tightening up and, and things like that. At the moment, is your view that the systems and processes we have are effective enough uh, because we are here and these issues have been brought to our attention. Are they effective enough, do you, do you think? And if not, what would you be planning to do at the moment to change things at the moment or tighten things up so that we've got a better chance of catching some of these issues as they before they occur? I'm going to, and unless you correct me, Mr Coffey, I'm going to assume that you're asking me not just about Tayside, but yeah. more broadly. Yeah, sure. Yeah. That would um, be fair, yeah. yeah. So I think that... Uh, the committee has already made points about you can have all the systems and processes in place, but still things can go wrong. And that generally has more to do with um, culture and leadership. However, the, the way to absolutely be certain that something will go wrong is not to have the systems and processes. That, that guarantees that something will go wrong. So we want to make sure that we learn from this. I've already indicated that I don't think that we have necessarily got adequate separation in the governance of endowment funds as separate from board funds. And we, we, we have a strong intention to, to, to proceed further with that. I think there will be things to be learned from what has happened in Tayside that will be of ge more general applicability. Um, and. I think we'll, we'll want to be together uh, with, with everyone who's involved in providing um, assurance on risk and uh, the audit of, of board funds to, uh, in, in, in reviewing any lessons that we can learn. However, I, I don't want to um, lapse into uh, any kind of platitude about, you know, lessons will be learned. I, I think that what has come to light in Tayside has been the result of um, a, a systemic uh, failure to address the underlying funding issues in NHS Tayside. And what I mean by that specifically is 
There have been presumptions made or assumptions made about asset sales, which then didn't materialise. There's been uh, what was done on the endowment funds, and I want to come back to that very briefly in a second, if I may. Um, there's what was done in terms of the transfer of e-health funds. Now, that th these are these are approaches which provide short-term relief. They do not provide a long-term sustainable financial solution. And that is what Tayside is now addressing under the new leadership that it has, but didn't address systemically over a number of years. That raises for me, as the accountable officer, a question about whether there were more things I should have noticed. And I'm taking personal responsibility for that. Um, and that's one of the things I want to review in these reports. Were there signals that I should have picked up as accountable officer? Or if there weren't, is there something I can do with the support of Christine and internal audit and, and our external auditors? Is there something I can do to make sure that these signals are brought to the surface in a clearer way earlier so that we can do something about it? So, specifically, I will be looking for assurance that I, as accountable officer, can better fulfil the role that I have, because I think in, in the, the evidence before us suggests that there were things that shouldn't have happened that did, and, and we weren't alert to them. Why I said I wanted to come back to the endowment point was, um, again, to move us away from this lessons learned uh, theme, NHS Tayside Board has decided and agreed to repay from resources into the endowment fund. I think that provides a very clear signal that they do not believe that the process that was followed was the right one. You said that perhaps there were signals that you should have picked up or that should have been picked up. But the Auditor General has done Section 22 reports on NHS Tayside for the last five years now. And the Chief Executive and Chairman came to you, I think, for the last five years looking for brokerage. So uh, my uh, take on this was that those signals were there in terms of the long-term sustainable funding situation at NHS Tayside. So why weren't they picked up upon? So the, the, the two things I was referring to were, one, the use of the endowment funds, and second, the use of the e-health funds. Were, were there things that I could have picked up on earlier? And um, I, I, I want to know if there were, um, and, and as yet I don't. But um, I think in general, uh, there is something about the way in which we address board's financial sustainability, and that was part of my response to Mr. Coffey. Um, I, I want to be clear that if there are other things that we could know that we didn't, then we find a way of knowing them. The, you're absolutely right that the um, Auditor General has done Section 22 reports, and um, of course, I, I've already mentioned the issue around asset sales that didn't then materialise. Uh, I think we... Uh, can say very clearly that we'd picked up at least some of the signals well over a year ago when, uh, on the 29th of March 2017, we asked Sir Lewis Ritchie to go in with the Assurance Advisory Group. So I'm, I'm not saying we didn't hear anything and that we didn't do anything. I mean, at that point, uh, uh, Tayside, over a year ago, were escalated, and as you know, they've since been escalated further on our ladder of, it, uh, of, of escalation. I'm, I'm simply trying to be as honest and straightforward with the committee as I can. That if there are more things that we can learn, I'm not in defensive mode. Hindsight is a marvellous thing, but this committee took evidence in Dundee um, a year past Christmas, and I think it was only last March that you, you did escalate it and Sir Lewis Ritchie's report was commissioned. Do you think action by your directorate should have been taken earlier on the situation at NHS Tayside? Well, as you say, convener, hindsight's a marvellous thing, but we did set up the Assurance Advisory Group. That didn't happen in a day. I mean, it, 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 I, I, I don't 
want to be facetious, but I didn't decide on the morning of the 29th of March to, to put it in place and announce it in the afternoon. That took some time to do. So you can be assured that we were uh, carrying a range of concerns early in 2017 that led us to that to that point. And we did listen, uh, obviously, to the evidence given to the committee and what the committee thought about it. And I think I think that was an, uh, it was an appropriate and proportionate response in the circumstances. Okay. I'm going to bring Liam Kerr in on this point and then Ian Gray. Yeah, just very briefly, if I may, good morning. Uh, on, y y you talked, Mr Gray, about the endowment funds uh, and uh, suggested that the, the actions of the, the new board uh, would suggest that there's been some misuse, if I can put it that way. Uh, but isn't there some amb ambiguity in the guidance around the use of the endowment funds? And if so, or in any event, how confident are you that this practice isn't happening throughout other boards uh, with perhaps the same consequences? Well, I've asked for um, assurances from all of the board chairs um, via the chairs of the endowment committees that retrospection has not been applied. And I've had these assurances as a said earlier to the committee i haven't had the opportunity to read all the letters yet but i mean i will do but i, I understand they, they do provide assurance that there has not been this, this a similar action taken in other boards mm -hmm. and i think given the prominence that this issue has um, i think i can be very confident that that this this will have been taken pretty seriously Oh, no doubt. But yeah. it, it, just to, to, to press the point, is there, um, is there ambiguity in the government guidance? I, I don't think so. But again, if, if we discover from the work that Oscar is doing that we could, we could clarify it in any way we will, I think it's worth remembering that in order for this retrospective payment to be made, Tayside had to suspend their own uh, constitution. So I think that was a fairly significant step which uh, other boards have not taken. Thank you. Ian Gray. <clears throat> well, um, the convener, um, Mr Gray, referred there to previous Section 22 reports from the Auditor General and the Auditor General obviously reports uh, annually and, and across the board on the NHS. And in an earlier evidence session on these issues, um, she made the point that she has uh, repeatedly uh, warned about the uh, risk to financial sustainability uh, of this board, but not just this NHS board. Um, and uh, in her view, the risk of a focus on short term, achieving short term financial objectives rather than long term uh, financial sustainability. You, you talked there about a failure to resolve fundamental underlying problems. That rather implies that the Auditor General thinks the fundamental underlying problem lay with the requirements placed on NHS Tayside rather than what they themselves did. I don't know. What, what would your reaction to that be? I, well, my initial reaction would be not to, to try to decide what the Auditor General uh, thought um but well, that's what she said um i, I what i w was saying was that there was an underlying issue with financial sustainability that tayside sought too often to fix by short-term means and that's why we put the assurance advisory group in and other steps that flowed from that um i think that the issue that presents in Tayside, um, which does have broader applicability, is the importance we attach to um, the pace of transformational change in the NHS and in the wider care system. And I, I think it will be evident to this committee that, for example, in Tayside, they had undertaken to um, uh, do some work on prescribing, which would uh, release some funds, and that didn't happen at the pace expected, and that had to be revisited, and I sent the Deputy Chief Medical Officer to support them with that. So the, what was happening was a series of short-term fixes, instead of sustaining a pace of transformational change that would be needed and remains needed in order to deliver the necessary financial sustainability. All of the health boards in Scotland 
are going through a process of transformational change. That's, that, that's necessary because of where we are, because of the demographic trends in the country, because of the, different, the changing patterns of demand and treatment and the opportunities that we have to treat people in better and different ways and to access things digitally rather than people having to come into play, to, you know, to surgeries and, and hospitals. So I, I would say that the, the key response to financial sustainability lies in the transformational changes that we are pursuing. The rate of these is important. Well, let, let, let me approach the same question from, from a slightly different angle then. Um, we've talked about a series of inquiries and investigations into what happened um, at NHS Tayside, what went wrong, uh, and to a degree, who was responsible, who did what. And, uh, uh, you know, to quite a significant degree, a number of those involved um, ha have, in a way, been found, ac found accountable already, the chief executive, the chair. Um, arguably the finance director as well, who retired earlier than, than expected. Um, and these investigations are looking at what happened and, and what was done and what was wrong and what should have been done differently. A possible explanation would be that NHS Tayside and the board had been asked to do something by the Scottish Government and by the Health and Social Care Directorate, which was simply impossible. That the task they had been given was impossible because they didn't have uh, the resources available in order to deliver the service they were required to deliver. Is that a possible explanation of what's gone wrong here? It's, it's theoretically possible because it's, it, would be fool, it would be a foolish person to say that a thing is impossible. However, if an accountable officer is asked to do something that is impossible, the first thing they ought to do is say so. They, you know, that, that, and that would be true in the health service, that would be true in any other service, that would be true of me as an accountable officer in the government. If you're asked to do something that is simply not possible, you're required to say so. Well, the Auditor General is suggesting that the current system in the NHS <coughs> doesn't make it possible for the NHS to achieve financial sustainability into the future. Is that not something that you should be looking into? Because perhaps what's happened in NHS Tayside is a, uh, a signal that, that there is a systemic problem wider than just that board. The NHS in this country, as in, I think, every other developed country in the world, will not be financially sustainable if it doesn't transform. So to that extent, I agree with the, uh, agree with the Auditor General. If we carry on doing what we're doing, that is not financially sustainable. Transformation is essential. What other boards... I do not think... Let me avoid too many double negatives. Other boards are not in the situation where they are um, having information uh, concealed from the board uh, by the finance director. Other boards are not in the situation where they are applying retrospective um, uh, funding from endowments. So there are a number of things happening in Tayside which we didn't consider acceptable, and as you've rightly said, so there's been persons held to account for that. Um, so th there are there are some substantive differences of material fact in Tayside that, that make their situation somewhat different. But a number of other boards are seeking brokerage in order to balance their books. That is absolutely, absolutely correct. And I think um, inter-year transfers of money is a sensible way to balance a £13 billion budget. I'd be, I'd be very, very uh, surprised if we came to the conclusion that, that uh, not allowing us to manage money across the the year end was, was, was a good thing to do. I mean, Audit Scotland um, make a number of important points about multi-year funding. I mean, that's affect what we're doing here um, through brokerage. So, it, 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 in terms of what's happened in NHS Tayside as they tried to, uh, to balance the books, you, you seem quite confident, Mr Gray, that that 
those kind of things, not necessarily exactly the same things, but those kind of things are not happening in other boards. Uh, can I ask if you've taken this opportunity to to check that, to survey it, to, to look for it? So, the, um, I'll ask Christine to come in in a second. Christine meets uh, monthly with the finance directors. I meet monthly with the, the chief executives. Uh, and I can absolutely assure you that the issues that have emerged in Tayside are well understood by the chairs in conversation with the cabinet secretary and me, the chief executives and the finance directors. And I think, it, I think there's no doubt in anybody's mind whatsoever that if similar issues uh, are extant in any other board that we will want to know about it. Have I surveyed it? Well, we've done what we've done on endowments. Clearly, we've written to all the boards and got our uh, responses back. But I think it's also been made clear by me in person to the chief executives that there is, a, that there is acceptable accounting practice, which I expect everyone to follow. And if there's any suggestion that that isn't followed, then that, that there, will be, there will be further action taken. Can I assure you, or anyone, that there is nothing happening in any board anywhere in, in a system of 156,000 employees with a budget of 13 billion. Again, I, I would be foolish to say that there is, there is nothing happening anywhere. But we have taken, I think, very serious steps following this to assure ourselves um, as fully as we can uh, about what is happening. And I think um, Audit Scotland are taking these issues very seriously. It's entirely a matter for Audit Scotland to decide what they do and don't include in their audits. I'm perfectly clear about that. But I can't imagine that they'll be overlooking the circumstances that have arisen uh, this year. Okay. Liam Kerr. Thank you, Convener. So I'd like to develop the, the points that Ian Gray has just been making, because it seems to me that or it seems that it fairly plausible that NHS Tayside, no one seems to have gained from this in terms of personal gain or anything like that. Uh, so if NHS Tayside weren't doing what's been going on out of any kind of malice or mischief, then the other conclusion is they're doing it out of need. And if I'm right on that, then as Ian Gray moves, the issue with NHS Tayside is one of financial sustainability. We then look at, we've had years of management changes, we've had transformative talks since I think about 2001, but still, I believe NHS Tayside is 1% below NRAC funding, uh, and it has, as Mr Gray identified earlier, a, a much bigger cost base. But the narrative that we've got here is local management is the problem. Local management is carrying the can. Uh, is there a possibility that we are isolating NHS Tayside, we are isolating the former management to detract from a, a wider narrative of underfunding and long-term failure in the system. No. I'd like to think that the committee would accept that whatever flaws I have, cowardice isn't one of them. And if I thought I had done wrong in this, I would take responsibility for this. The NHS is under pressure here in Scotland. I'm not in any doubt about that at all. I don't think anybody is, but that's why we have developed a transformational change approach. And we have not simply said on a piece of paper that we're going to transform. We have regional leads. We have a regional structure coming in, in the sense of regional delivery. We have local delivery plans for each of the health boards. We have uh, a new uh, and developing approach to recruitment. Um, we have a workforce plan. We, we are addressing the issues that we face as comprehensively, I think, as any health service in the developed world. Every health service that I know of 
struggles to recruit in some specialties. Every <coughs> health service that I know of um, would be delighted if it had more money. But every health service that I know of that is competent is transforming, and that's what we are seeking to do. I think I'll stop there. I'm happy to answer more questions, but I, I would not accept the proposition that we had uh, somehow uh, m made a scapegoat of the leadership of a particular board. Before we come back to the transformational change, I, Mr Gray asked about the brokerage in other boards. Are you able to elaborate on how many other boards are going to need brokerage this year or next? Uh, yes, I can, um, and we can give this in writing to, to the committee. Um, but, Christine, do you want to just go over that for the committee? I think yeah, so um, th this, year, this current financial year's position will yet to be settled, but we can say what would happen for last year and what we see in prospect for this year. So, um, for 2017-18, because obviously that, that year is still subject to the annual audit process, but we've... Um, formally agreed brokerage with Ayrshire and Arden and with um, Highland and we are um, we have an indicative figure of £12.7 million pounds for Tayside but we are awaiting confirmation from the Chief Executive on that and subject to some further discussions with audit. So um, Ayrshire and Arden is £23 million, Highland is £15 million, so just over £50 million pounds for 2017-18 is where we stand um, at this point in time. Um, and, and the, the difference there is that the cumulative position in Tayside, because there's been brokerage since 2012-13, um, is around £45 million pounds cumulatively. Um, so it, it's, it, it is in a different, a different position. Um, the, the point you make about NRAC funding, Tayside was actually an NRAC gainer until 2017-18. Um, there's changes in the, uh, in the, in the formula, um, flipped Tayside into be a board that was below parity and they received additional funding. So it, it's not, again, it's not in a similar position to some boards that have been like uh, below parity for um, five, ten years. So, so the notion of underfunding, I guess just to be clear that Tayside have received their fair share based on the, the formula of funding for, for the board. There's, there's nothing that I can see that would suggest anything that's disproportionate to Tayside from other boards. In the NX situation, I say just come into play in 2017-18, and Tayside received £8 million of additional funding as a result of the, the formula change. Um, so I think it's just worth being, being quite clear on that point. Just something that arises from that, uh, again, to be clear, um, you say that NHS Tayside received its fair share of NRAC funding. Does that imply, because I think NHS Grampian hasn't received NRAC funding uh, for some considerable time? Uh, well, as you know, there are a number of boards um, that... that um, we, our approach has been to have boards within um, 1%, so nobody's less than 1% from their funding target, and we've moved that to, to 0.8%. I'm, I'm trying to differentiate, therefore, that Tayside has not been in that same position as, as boards like Grampian or, or Lothian mm -hmm. sure. have done. And, and also things like their, their, the, the cost base, as we've discussed before its committee, the, the cost per head, the, the proportionate share of spend on things like workforce and, and drugs has been disproportionate um, in Tayside. So, I think there is there is some evidence to back up the argument that there are underlying the underlying um, cost base of Tayside has not um, has not been resolved in a sustainable recurring way over that that period of time since 2013. Thank you. Uh, so, Mr. Gray, um, going back to the transformation. Uh, so, you said transformation is essential, uh, and I think we can probably all understand that. Uh, but what evidence? I think the public will want to understand or at least have confidence that transformation is happening and is going to happen at the pace and the scale that is required. Uh, and do you have any key milestones, if I can put it that way, as to what will show this is happening? Yes, um, and, and I, think, I think the best evidence that the public can be given is what, what is in place. Um, because we can, you know, we can promise to do things, but, but um, you know, at the moment uh, in Highland, for example, um, instead of travelling long distances, people are having their uh, consultations by uh, vi by video link, um, supported as necessary 
uh, with, locally by um, clinical staff. So, so that's actually you know begun to happen. That's not tomorrow or next week. That's that's happening now. Um, similar things happening in in, in Ayrshire, where, uh, for example, if if you live in Cumnock and uh, suffer from uh, cardiac obstructive pulmonary disease, so lung lung disease or heart disease, um, you can be supported at home, whereas before you would have had to be admitted to hospital. There are some very significant transformations already in train in the integration of health and social care. Um, in West Lothian, there is a REACT team, which now goes to the houses of elderly people who would otherwise have had to be admitted to hospital. We are um, spreading these good practices across Scotland. Um, you know, I'm not going to give you a great long list. We can provide detail to the committee if it's helpful. Uh, we have, uh, as I've indicated, um, uh, put in place a three-part um, workforce plan uh, in consultation with, with COSLA and others, which I think is very important. Um, we've changed the way that we re uh, recruit or we've added to the recruitment of GPs. We've said that we will add 800 mental health uh, professionals into the into the staffing uh, we've uh, done work to enhance health visitors so so yes we we are doing this it's not a, it's not all a future prospect and people can see the reality of it on the ground but we have to keep this moving I'm very happy if the committee would find it helpful to provide you with a, a detailed update on the transformation plans we've just had the regional uh, plans in from the three regions and uh, also from the um, national boards. And if the committee would, would like an update on that, I'm more than happy to give it. I think that would be beneficial. Yeah. Uh, the one final thing, just again, sticking with the transformation, so you mentioned earlier about the financial position, and I think you were suggesting that part of the, or perhaps it was Ian Gray put it, that part of the difficulty is that a lot of what's been going on is about short-term financial uh, management, if you like, rather than long-term financial sustainability. Uh, and I think earlier, Mr Gray, you were talking about, look, we need to sh shift that focus. Uh, I think we'd agree. Um, but is that happening? Will it happen? Uh, and what needs to change overall? to allow a long-term financial sustainability view to, to take root? Well, I think <clears throat> what um, one of the things that need to happen, needs to happen, and it, it goes back, I think, to points that um, Mr Beattie and others were making at the beginning about, you know, why did this happen as opposed to, you know, what processes do we have in place? We need to make absolutely sure that individuals who who are concerned about things have have a, have a way of raising them that they that they that they genuinely believe will be effective and not cause them any difficulty um and we've done some work on uh, whistleblowing but that's really a, that's really a very far away end of the spectrum I, I would i would hope that we would rarely have to get there but it would be safe to do for people to do so if they did but what has become evident, I think, in, in the way that we've looked at some of the issues around Tayside is that there were some people who were concerned, and, and Ms Mara's made reference to concerns by internal audit, for example. We need to be absolutely sure that if people have concerns, they're, they're able to raise them. We also need to be absolutely sure that we don't include optimism bias in our predictions. That's one of the issues that beset the, 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 the um, situation around prescribing in Tayside. They, they were absolutely right about what they were trying to do, but there was optimism bias in the point by which they said they could do it. We need to weed that out. We also need to accept that sometimes change is hard. You know, it will involve us discussing with national and local politicians changes to the way services are provided in order to do something better, then that may also involve stopping doing something that happens at the moment. Now, the problem I think we sometimes beset ourselves with is that we, we, we lead with the negative rather than the positive. Instead of saying, this is what we can provide, 
And here are the changes we need to make in order to provide that. We start with the, here's what we're going to have to stop doing sentence. And that gets people off on the wrong foot. So I think we, do, we, need, we need to get better at being clear about what it is we are going to do. And that's why I've given you some examples of things that are actually happening as opposed to things that might happen. And we need to get better at being really clear with folk. And I mean, by that, I mean citizens as much as anything else about what can be done. I, I generally find the citizens of Scotland to be a fairly um, sensible and very bright lot. They understand very clearly what's put in front of them if it's done properly. And I think we just need to get better at that. Thank you. Mr Gray, on that point, do you think what NHS Tayside is doing on prescribing paracetamol undermines the government's policy of free prescriptions? No, I don't think it does. I certainly don't think it's intended to. Alex Neil. Paul, can I go back <coughs> to the very first question that Colin Beatty asked, just to clarify the position of the Chief Executive? Um, my understanding, and I think the understanding of the committee, is that the Chief Executive was dismissed as Chief Executive. Is that right? No, no not, not exactly, Mr Neil. I, I'll explain the process yeah. for the committee. So on, on escalation to level five on the on, on, on the ladder of intervention, um, I uh, met the chief executive to uh, inform her that that was the decision that the cabinet secretary had taken. And the to, to dis, just to clarify, to dismiss her? N no, no, to, esca right, let, to let, escalate. Let me come right, to okay, the end. Yeah. It, so to, to escalate to right. level five. Okay. I also informed her that the consequence of that would be that her accountable officer status would be removed. So that doesn't cause her to cease to be an employee of NHS Tayside. But it stops her being chief executive. Indeed. It stops her being chief executive. So what date was that? Uh, fourth. Thursday the 5th of April. So I've got a timeline in here again, yeah. which I'm happy to, to share with you. Yeah. I met her on the Thursday afternoon and yeah. explained that the Cabinet Secretary's decision and the consequence of that. She um, understood what I had said to her. Christine was also present for part of the discussion and uh, asked that um, she be allowed to go back to Tayside to let her own team know and that undertook to revert to me the following day. Uh, having, you know, and I thought giving someone 24 hours to reflect on that was not an unreasonable thing for me to do. Uh, the morning of the following day, that is the Friday, um, the medical director of NHS Tayside, Dr Andrew Russell, contacted me to say that Miss McClay had been uh, to her doctor that morning and uh, was signed off sick. So when I spoke to her, she wasn't off sick, but she was signed off sick by her doctor the following morning. So as of the Friday, was she no longer the chief executive? That was the effect of the decision, um, and we wrote, I put that formally in writing, and right. that's... and. So and Malcolm Wright is appointed as the accountable officer. So she's, at what point does she technically, what hour of which of those two days does she technically stop being the chief executive? Well, technically, when I wrote, when I wrote to her, but the, 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 the fact of the matter was established on the, on, on the, th on the Thursday afternoon. Right. So how, how do you get dismissed as chief executive and remain an employee? If anybody's dismissed from a job, you're dismissed. No, if, if your accountable officer's re, uh, responsibilities are removed, you can no longer function as chief executive. But in order for a person to be dismissed, there would have to be a process gone through, and that's, again, standard um, employment practice. Um, and uh, so she remains an employee of NHS Tayside. But you may remember, um, when I was the Cabinet Secretary, um, a similar situation for different reasons arose in Grampian. That's correct. And the Chief Executive was dismissed. No, he retired. 
Ah, he retired. <laughs> well, I mean, uh, he well, went, but he yes, retired. He retired. So, but he and I did not remove his accountable officer status. He decided to go to, to go voluntarily. So, um, in terms of so, what job if if Miss McLean's still with Tayside Health Board? So, what is her job today? Well, at the moment, she doesn't have a job today because she's off sick. But when she is able to return to work, then we will agree with her what her future employment status should be. And that again will be done. Uh, that will be done appropriately. I, for in the interest of transparency to the committee, I should make clear that Miss McLeay's representatives are in touch with us, but I can't say more than that just now. Right. Can I ask uh, if if I'm a nurse uh, and I get um, you know I'm not up to the job, and I've told them not up to the job, and I'm going to be dismissed as a nurse, I'm not offered any other alternative employment in the National Health Service. Does this great rule just apply to chief executives? Well, since I don't yet know what's going to happen, I can't answer that question abstractly. But if, if, you, if you're an employee of the NHS and you're taken through a disciplinary process and dismissed, that's quite a different thing from being told that your accountable officer status has been taken away. And if some, even if someone does go through a process, um, it is not uh, impossible for them to be offered another role at a different level elsewhere in the service. What won't happen... But is it not one rule for chief executives and another rule for everybody else? No, it's the same employment contract. But, I mean, how many nurses who are uh, sacked for not doing the job then got offered to stay on? Well, I can't say, because I don't know. I suspect none. I think what I would say, though, is that it's important that we go through a proper employment process with every employee. Yeah. And I do know of situations in which an employee who has uh, not been able to fulfil one role has nevertheless been offered an alternative role that better meets their skills. But my point is, these have been the examples I know anyway have all been in senior positions, and it seems to me, you know, we've got a two-tier system. If you're in a senior position, even if though you, you've not, you know, done the job properly in the view of senior management and the board, then you can go offered another position, possibly a protected salary, I don't know. Um, uh, but if you're down the line, if you're a porter or a nurse, that doesn't happen to you, you're off the premises more or less right away. Well, that's Mr. Not, Neil... That's not the right way to run a health service, is it? The right way to run a health service is to observe people's terms and conditions of employment, and that's what we're seeking to do in this case, as we should in every other one. So, so what's the process from here on in, then? I mean, presum presumably the disciplinary process can only start when Ms McClay returns to work, for example. That would be correct. Right. And, I mean, depending on how seriously ill she is, she could theoretically be off for a year and still... Is that right? That would be the same for any other employee, yeah. yes. And for any other employee, after a year uh, off ill... Um, you would normally then have your contract terminated. As I would need to check on the specifics of all the yeah. contracts, but that would be my general understanding, yes. And, and you know, presumably you come to some kind of severance arrangement. Again, that would all depend on the circumstances. I can't say on, on you know, yeah. without access to specific circumstances. But you can see the, the concern that there is here where... Somebody is being dismissed from the job they're in, uh, appears to be possibly getting offered alternative employment, uh, possibly getting a severance payment, possibly before any of that happens, could be off sick for, for up to a year uh, at, at tax sales expense, obviously. Um, and I'm not saying that's not, I mean, that's employment law. I'm not, I realise that. But... You know, these, the, this, these circumstances really um, create a lot of cynicism uh, amongst other employees in the health service, particularly the ones further down the rung, who don't get this kind of treatment. Um, and yet they see senior people getting 
favourable treat as the poets they would see as favourable treatment. I can't really comment without specific detail, Mr Neil. A, a person who is off sick is entitled to their terms and conditions, and I can't really go beyond that. OK. Can I just, for clarification, obviously, as the accounting officer, as chief executive, you hold two positions, as chief executive, and you're a member of the board. I take, okay. it, I take it Ms McLean is no longer a member of the board? That is also correct. Right. OK. Can I just move on to one other subject? I, I mean, obviously, we've been talking about um, Section 22s for the last five years. Uh, we've had a lot now of external auditors. I mean, at the moment, we've got two or three reports going on being carried out by large accountancy companies. How much money over the last five years, including the current investigations, what's the total cost of all of this been? And, and is that financed by out of the budget of NHS T side or out of the Scottish Government's own budget? Well, um, um, I think I gave to the committee last time I was here a figure of £211,000 for the um, EY uh, work that was done. If the committee would like um, a, a, an update on the cost of the various reviews, I'm yeah. more than happy to provide them, but clearly I can't do all of that until they're finished. Yeah. Uh, but, but, I mean, you, you'll know how much they're going to cost. You know, at least, I mean, you, you'll know how much the contracts are, are worth, obviously. So what would be very helpful is just a list over the last five years of all these external work commissioned as a result of the problems in, in, in NHS T side, um, you know, who, who did what, when, and how much did it cost the taxpayer? And, and if it's a current contract, what's the estimated cost? Yeah. Uh, I, I realise that, you know, in terms of expenses and stuff, it may not yeah. be absolutely accurate to the penny because that hasn't been completed. But I think yeah. order of magnitude of the cost of all of this yeah. would be useful for... We are an audit committee, yeah. so we should be looking at these things. Yeah. That would be no problem. Just for clarity, Mr Gray, of course, on a separate issue, but for NHS Tayside, there is a new review of the Cars View uh, unit that's just about to start. Just to follow on from Mr Neil's point, will the cost of that review be met by NHS Tayside, or has that been met by the Scottish Government? I think the chairman of NHS Tayside announced that, so the, his the expectation would be that, that Tayside would meet the costs of the review. OK, thank you. Can I... Um, follow up on the issue of the endowment funds again. Um, <clears throat> I want to refer back to the initial report in the Herald newspaper by um, Helen McCardle. And this is an issue that I've been concerned about since this story broke. Um, the journalist source said that the actual sum signed off was 4.3 million. And when I say signed off, signed off by the board for transfer into the endowment fund. And it goes on to say, although only 2.71 million was spent of it in 13-14. My concern, Mr Gray, is that if 4.3 million was signed off, was 4.3 million transferred from the charity pot into the core funding pot, or was it only the 2.71 million that was transferred? Now, I raised this issue with Malcolm Wright at the NHS Tayside MPMSP briefing a week past Friday, and Bill Bowman and Liam Kerr both heard me raise it on the record. And Malcolm Wright, the chairman of NHS Tayside, said that the 4.3 million figure did not mean anything to him. I'm concerned that that 1.6 million that's not been spent might still be in the core spending budget, having been transferred from the charity endowment budget. Can you give me any clarity on this? We've followed that up, and Christine can give you some detail. We, we anticipated it might come up. OK. So the, I, I, we've asked for a formal position from, from the board, and I'm still waiting for that, because they've been looking at it in detail. To, to, to clarify, the total level of potential um, bids, if you like, that went to the endowment committee at the beginning of this process was closer to £6 million. So possible propositions that could be funded from endowments. The Endowments Committee made um, decisions on, on 
um, some of them feeling appropriate and others others not appropriate. Um, what the accounts for the endowments show was, um, two, I think there's two figures quoted. One was £3.6 million pounds of funds um, that were approved um, and 2.7 that they believed were retrospective. Um, we've asked the board to confirm the value and they've been doing due diligence on those figures. Um, in my understanding, verbally, we're still waiting for it in writing from the board so that they understand that the total sums that were transferred from um, the NHS board expenditure to endowments in that year was £3.6 million. Pounds, but I'm waiting for that in writing. So that's that's where we are just now. I don't expect it to be 2.7. I expect it to be higher. It seems like it's in the region of, of 3.6. What the board are looking at is whether any of that was um, expenditure that then took place in the following year. Um, because we want to make sure that we, we have one number um, and we understand the total. But that, so that's where we are today with the figures. OK, so. sorry, two questions on that. I think you just said transferred from NHS core funding to charity. Would it not be the other way round? Um, well, so the, the um, I guess it has the same ultimate effect as whether the expenditure sat in the books of the accounts and funding transferred. Um, I think what they did was they transferred the expenditure to, to endowments. Um, but the, the point is how much of the, um, the the financial position at the year end was um, was then charged to endowment funds, and it, it looks like it's more than the two point seven. It's around three point six million pounds. But the board are clarifying that for us just now. Okay, let me see if I understand that correctly. So you think three point? It looks like we're still waiting for board confirmation that three point six was spent. So if or you, trans was it, more. Is it possible that more than that was transferred and is still sitting so that's in the wrong the budget? So are, are clarifying. Right. I, 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 it, the, um, their understanding today is it's three point six million pounds. I think there was a bit of an issue. That there was some. Uh, there are different categories of endowment funds or restricted funds and general funds, yeah. and they needed to look at both together. Okay. So we've asked them to clarify the total amount and also whether anything was um, expenditure that then took place in the following year. Yeah. So in fourteen fifteen, so we'll get the total picture. The board are very keen to get keen to get that clarified with us okay. too, and they'll write to us formally with the position on that. Okay. We've asked them to make sure that their endowment um, auditor is comfortable with that figure too. Okay. For me, this is a really key point because the whole endowment issue was a breach of public trust, and if there is any, um, if there's any uncertainty yeah. about how much money was transferred, where it's sitting, you know, for the people, for especially the nurses who go out and raise this money for, for Nine Wells Hospital and for other hospitals around. I think this needs to be really clear about how much money was transferred, how much was spent and how much is being repaid. Can you tell me, um, Ms McLaughlin, of the six pieces of work that are being done, mm. which piece of work will outline this? Which... So the, the work that Grant Thornton are doing, to be clear, will, will be the bit that looks at what... If you think about it, this was expenditure that, that was already been recorded in the accounts of the board, um, and then there was a decision to be able to seek funding from endowments for it. So the, the Grant Thornton work will look at what sat in the accounts of the board and what expenditure was then um, transferred to endowment funds. So I expect, just to be clear, I expect the Grant Thornton work to be able to clarify that position. What I've asked for, though, is that the endowment fund auditor verifies that figure, um, particularly if it's different from what was in the accounts at the time. Grant Thornton report that will report on Tuesday. So the, the report on Tuesday will be a draft report in, in to me on okay. Tuesday. So and I, will I that be made public? I, I, would, I would expect, it, as with any report, to have a period of, of um, review, probably for another, another week beyond it, but certainly no more than that. And yes, that will be made made public. I think all of the reports we would expect to be made public um, from this work, but I would expect it probably to be a week beyond um, the date given. That's the date for the draft report. It's Tuesday next week. Report before the Cabinet Secretary I was comes just to the about to say, Mr Neil, the Cabinet Secretary is coming to the committee on the 24th of May, and we had anticipated yes, we actually having the Grant Thornton report on the 15th of May. I think I'd certainly anticipated well, that. Well, I'll certainly undertake to have it turned around as quickly as we can. The, dra the draft is due in on Tuesday of next week, so um, we can I can let you know at that point in time what the turnaround period will be to, to close that off before the committee appearance on the 24th. OK, so... Just so I'm clear on this, you said the board were writing to you 
with um, clarification on this issue as well. So I suppose we will have two pieces of evidence. What Grant Thornton make of the transfers from endowment to core expenditure and what was spent, what was transferred yep. and where the money is currently sitting. Yes. And we will mm -hmm. also have the reply from John Brown, Chairman of NHS Tayside, to you, Christine McLaughlin, with details of that as well. Is that correct? That's, that's, that's correct. OK, and can that correspondence be made available to the committee as well? I, I, the default position is that all of this correspondence will be made available to you. Thank you. And when do you expect to receive that reply? Um, to be honest, I'd hoped to have it before coming today so that I could give you a firm position. So um, I expect it in any, any day. I would hope, it was, hope it, to get it today or tomorrow. And do you know what kind of processes they're using to look at this? Is it internal audit or is it, have they brought in someone to help them clarify what's happened with this money? So the, 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 the finance team have been going through all of the transactions that, that went through the, le the finance ledger in that, in that um, period so that they can do that review. Yes, they've had their own internal audit, look at it as well. Um, I think it's really important that the endowment fund auditor looks at it too, because it, it needs to correspond with what was in the accounts. And if it doesn't, I think we'd really like to understand um, the reasons for any, any discrepancy on it. So, Is I, that the I, same endowment fund auditor who was in charge when the constitution was suspended and yes. this money was transferred? Is, is that satisfactory? Well, it, um, on its own, probably probably not. But with those other pieces of um, of work, that I think that will get get us to the bottom of the issue. It's not it's not a hugely it shouldn't be a hugely complicated piece of work. There were um, there were around thirty transactions that were agreed to be funded from endowments in that period. So really, they literally need to look at every single one and understand what expenditure was agreed to be transferred to endowment funds. So in, in the scheme of a you know a, a, a board dealing with seven hundred million pounds. Of expenditure, this is relatively uh, should be relatively straightforward to follow those transactions through. But the, the final piece of assurance that I'll get is from the Grant Thornton oversight of that work. I agree with you; it should be relatively trans uh, straightforward. But it should have been relatively straightforward from the start that this money should never have have been trans transferred. So I, I'll only be satisfied once we've got the figures in front of us and we know that there is no charitable funds resting within NHS Tayside's core budget. And, and that's why um, we, we, I'd rather have it one figure and agree what that figure is rather than have something that moves. So I, it was important to give the board the time to make sure they had done that full, okay. full review, but I would expect it today or tomorrow. Okay. Another point on, on this topic, uh, Mr Gray, you said in response to a question from one of my colleagues earlier that I think you had, I can't remember the exact words you used, but anticipated some sort of separation in the future around trustees of the health boards and the uh, endowment trustees. A couple of questions around that. It seems from the evidence that your department have gathered from around Scotland so far, it seems to be working well in other places. So are you concerned that the rules might change just because of this issue in NHS Tayside, which I think have occurred of a lack of governance, suspending the constitution? And secondly, if you were to put in changes, are we then going to see effectively two boards in health boards, one to manage the endowment funds and one to manage core business? Um, I think you're right, uh, first of all, to ask the um, if it isn't broken, don't fix it question. Uh, however, I think there is an issue here of public confidence. And I think the way to address that is to ensure that there is visible separation. I think what we don't want is to create um, some enormous additional bureaucracy around all of this, so I accept that uh, as an important point. And clearly, um, people who are employed by the board and some of the members of the non executive members of the uh, board may uh, still be required to attend the meetings of the endowment committee. I wouldn't propose to take them all away from that uh, as support to it. But I think having that visible independence is important. The, the, it's really important that we use the opportunity too to re-emphasise that the constitution of endowment committees is set up in a way that um, makes sure that ministers can have no influence over what they decide. Now that's that's the case at the moment. So uh, you know that's not some future proposition, but I think that's maybe been somewhat lost as well in all of this. Um, so I, I I just want to make it as clear as I can to the public that these uh, endowment 
uh, funds are uh, entirely separate and, and, and free from any potential conflict of interest. Because um, certainly in terms of applying the, the Nolan principles, it's not simply enough that there should be no conflict of interest, but there should not be a perception of one either. And I want to avoid that perception. I think the point you have made about the importance that the public attach to seeing that money that they have donated is spent in ways which they would expect uh, only adds to the strength of my view that working with Oscar, we ought to make that separation as clear as possible. So you're going to wait for Oscar's recommendations on this, really? We, we, will, we will certainly wait um, for them on that, although I don't think that if Oscar believe that some detailed work is needed on things that they find, that we need to wait until all the detailed work is done. I think there's a decision of principle here, which is the separation of the endowment um, oversight from the oversight of the board, bearing in mind all the points you've made. I, I think we should just get ahead with that, frankly. I don't see any reason to, to, to wait around on you. I agree, Mr Gray, and I, that's the impression I got from the Cabinet Secretary in the Chamber um, when she gave her statement as well. Can I ask one more question on that? The um, I asked the Cabinet Secretary that day she made her statement to do a skills audit of the board of NHS Tayside, and I think she said that um, the current chairman, John Brown, is already undertaking that. In what form do you expect to receive that back? Presumably it won't come under any of the six pieces of work that are going on. Is that going to be reported to you separately? Yes, it will, and I think that is something... Um, in terms of the public record, uh, which we shall uh, have to be thoughtful about, in that I don't think it would be routine to place on the record um, an assessment of individuals. Uh, we don't, as I think I've said in response to questions at committees before, we don't generally conduct individuals' appraisals in public. There will be there will be two parts to this. One will be the non-executive component of the board. Um, and the chairman's assessment of that. And as I made clear to the board on the uh, day that, uh, the first day that John Brown was th there and when, when I meant, went to meet them, I expect any incoming chair to do that, to, to make an assessment of um, the capability and capacity of the board as a whole, um, not least for succession planning purposes. The second part of that, of course, is the capability and capacity of the executive members of the board, and that would be routinely delegated to the chief executive to do. And I can give the committee assurance that both I and the cabinet secretary have already discussed these matters with the, the chair and the chief executive, and uh, we will expect to hear from them um, before uh, I would think the end of June on what their assessment of all of that is. Um, not least because if we do require to carry out further recruitments, then we want to do that expeditiously. Okay. So you said that not a lot of these appraisals can be made public. So what information will the committee get about that process so that we're satisfied that it has been done and looked at properly? I think I don't want to preempt what John Brown and Malcolm Wright do, but um, what I would expect to be able to tell the committee is a that the process has been completed, and b that if it has concluded that some recruitment or additional resourcing is required, what that is. <clears throat> okay. Thank you, Mr. Gray. Want the transfer of endowment funds was made back in September 2014, and it only came to light in April 2018. That's three and a half. Um, years later, and I think part of the issue for that is the lack of transparency. Um, if anyone's to go online and look at health board papers for any meeting, you find well over 100, often into 200 pages, and it is extremely difficult to make head nor tail of what is being talked about at the board. Um, and it's my opinion that these papers are designed to obfuscate um, issues. Um, it's very difficult for politicians, journalists, or any member of the public to actually know what is going to be discussed at the health board. Is this something following this suspension of constitution transfer of, of funds that you're concerned about? And have you made any recommendations to health boards to try and um, make these papers a bit more understandable? I think... Uh what I would say 
first of all, is acknowledge that some of the papers that I have seen are, are opaque, so I'm not going to argue about that. Um, and I think it will be important that, uh, as part of learning from this, we do try to make things a bit, a bit clearer and simpler. Um, again, if I may express a, a view formed of experience, that agendas with um, 15 or 20 items on them are not actually going to lead to the conduct of particularly successful business. I think we should try and keep this simple and keep in the forefront of our minds that um, while, of course, uh, I as, as accountable officer and I'm, I'm accountable directly to Parliament, we're accountable to the public for how we spend the money that they give us in their taxes. And we ought to be clear about what we're doing with them. So I don't object to your point. Okay. Do members have any further questions? Bill Bowman. A relatively, I hope, straightforward one. We're speaking about board members. Are all board members equal? Do they all have the same legal responsibility um, for the actions of the board? There are, there are executive and non-executive members. They're, 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 they're jointly and severally uh, accountable for the board, but the, the accountability runs um, from the, the chair to the cabinet secretary I and, and from the chief executive to me. But if you're on the board and something happens like this, um, you know, you, you, you presumably can't sort of just stand back and say, well, I'm there because I was appointed by a local authority or I'm a representative of some faction. I mean, do, do the board members realise that they are all, as you say, jointly and severally liable? I would hope that they do. Um, and as it happens, uh, I have a meeting with a wide range of non-executive directors on Monday, the 14th. I suspect they might. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I uh, think it's a point that perhaps when we have issues like this coming up, that um, they perhaps realise it is a, a group or a collegiate situation. Indeed, although I think it doesn't, it, it, it doesn't detract from the point that individuals are accountable for their own actions, uh, which I think is perhaps crystallised somewhat in Tayside. Mm -hmm. But you need to watch out for who's sitting next to you then, perhaps. OK, Liam Kerr. Uh, briefly, Mr Gray, so uh, the convener talked about the senior management, uh, and we talked earlier about transformation and uh, how we move to the future. Um, this committee has been rather concerned about, on a general level, about um, boards and the constitution and the talent within that and what they're doing. Uh, obviously, we're in a situation at the moment where we have uh, a reducing pool, if you like, of clearly very good quality senior management, but taking on a number of different roles. Uh, so the question is, uh, what is the Scottish Government doing to ensure that the leaders of the future are coming through, are being recruited, and th those who aspire to those roles uh, are uh, being groomed for them, if I can put it that way? I'm thinking about the health service in particular or the wider public service in general? I'll put the health service to you in your current role. Certainly. So, so um, we have uh, now developed a, a leadership development programme because I, I, I think that we had um, some way to go in having a proper succession planning and talent management approach in the NHS in Scotland. That, that programme is now developed in place and up and running and supported by something uh, called Project Lift, which is intended to work in a way that brings on people from um, in, in the, within the system and beyond it uh, into positions of leadership. Um, I, I'm uh, pretty clear that that, that represents a, a considerable step forward from what we had in the past. And if the committee would find it helpful, I'm happy to share brief, not long and opaque, details uh, of, of that programme and how it works and who's engaged in it. I, should, I did want to make the point, however, that that fits within a broader leadership development programme um, that the permanent secretary herself has been uh, sponsoring with, with some determination to ensure that we, we're, we're developing senior leaders across the whole of the public service in Scotland, not just exclusively in 
if you like, organisational silos. Thank you. Willie Coffey. Just give you a, a, forgive me, I should have asked this earlier when I was asking you about adequacy of internal audit systems and processes. And the, the letter from Colin Sinclair, NHS National Services, refers to a report to that board that says they highlighted specific areas of possible risk which would benefit from additional internal audit attention during 2018-19 and the board agreed that these have to be implemented immediately. So uh, if you can't tell us what these are now, could you, could you write to the committee and tell us what, what these are and what the significance of these additional measures are? Certainly. Um, I, I will uh, I intend to cover that in my meeting with, with Elizabeth Ireland and Colin Sinclair, which I mentioned had had to be cancelled um, because I wanted to understand more about that myself and what, how they were proposing to respond to these. I know, I do know they've taken it very seriously. I've already had that assurance from the chair and the, the chief executive, but I just want to understand more clearly um, what these areas of risk were, whether they have general applicability or whether they're specific to NSS. Um, okay. And I will certainly write to the committee uh, following that discussion with, with them. Thank you. Thanks. Any further questions? Can I thank you both uh, very kindly for your evidence this morning. I now close the public session of the Audit Committee.